Chair, dear members, thank you very much for having us this afternoon. My name is Art Legal, Director at KEA, a consultancy specialised in culture, creative industries and sport, and I'll present today with my colleague Theodora, co-researcher on that study. So, very briefly on the structure of the presentation, this is quite straightforward. At this stage, I would just like to flag that we have, um, for discussion purposes, put the policy recommendations and the quick analysis of the Commission's midterm review of Creative Europe in Annex, after, uh, so we can discuss this after um, these 10 minutes. So the objectives of the study were, of course, to provide an analysis of Creative Europe. We looked at objectives, structure, decision-making process, and also the impact of its implementation. And perhaps more, most importantly, to provide recommendations to the members of the CULT Committee to shape the future of Creative Europe. Um, so I'm going to start by presenting the key findings. Sorry. I'm going to start by presenting the key findings of our study. Uh, first of all, Creative Europe uh, has identified the right objectives um, to address the European culture and creative sector weaknesses and to start to support them. Um, the first main objective is to promote cultural diversity across Europe. Uh, the program does this in two ways. Uh, first of all, it supports the circulation of European culture and audiovisual works. And second of all, it supports audience development in the cultural sector. Also, uh, another uh, important objective is to support capacity buildings for the, for the sector, which implies skills development, uh, international networking, access to finance, and also to develop better and more harmonizing uh, cultural statistics across Europe. Uh, also, another important key finding is that overall, the Creative Europe's budget, earmark budget for the seven years from 2014 to 2020, is considered insufficient uh, relating to the importance of the sector to the European overall economy and society. That is 1.4 billion euros. Um, this is the budget uh, to cover all the member states uh, and to strive to achieve geographically balanced results. Um, this relatively low budget, um, together with the high amount of application, because it turns out that the Creative Europe program is, uh, is highly uh, popular, um, uh, give, up to, give to a low success ratio, um, and which, which uh, has no significant part uh, of, the, of the market structure. And here we show a brief uh, graph uh, for both the media subprogram and the culture subprogram to show the rate of application from 2014 to 2017. <clears throat> Another important aspect of Creative Europe um, is that it, it managed very well in terms of uh, networking the cultural and creative sectors, developing a European community of cultural and creative operators, and perhaps more, more importantly, to also bridge the gap between cultural and creative operators and policy makers, including at EU level as well. Um, Two aspects I'd like to, to flag here. One is the guarantee facility of Creative Europe, um, which is a very innovative instrument and which can potentially um, deliver a huge boost in terms of access to finance for the sector. So far it has earmarked uh, 50 million euros and it's expected to leverage more than 600 million euros funding for cultural and creative SMEs. Another thing which I'd like to mention is the international dimension. Um, it's a huge priority, especially since the 2016 Communication on Culture and External Relations, but there is little uh, human resources earmarked for it under Creative Europe, and no financial resources as well. Another uh, important aspect of our research relates to the decision-making process at EU level, which was applied to the Creative Europe program. Uh, currently, the decision-making process distinguishes between two types of non-legislative acts, which are the Delegated Acts and the Implementing Acts, short DS. Um, uh, the co-legislators, so the European Parliament and the Council, together decide on whether conferring to the Commission whether delegated or implementing powers in order to implement EU law. Um, of course, while there are lots of differences between the delegated and implementing acts. We're not going to go now into details, but they are very well explained in our, in our study. The main, um, the main uh, differences consist in the fact that the delegated acts um, are required when further legislative, legislative amendments or supplements are required to the EU law, the basic EU law. Uh, and while implementing acts are required uh, when the, the EU law is to be implemented as such by the Commission while uh, ensuring uniform conditions for implementation. 
uh, in the Creative Europe program, the, dele the delegated acts uh, are to be used in the eventuality where um, uh, the list of indicators which are used to evaluate the program need to be um, amended or supplemented, while the implementing acts are basically the annual work program via which the Commission implements the, the program. While we uh, took a look at the evolution of the program in terms of annual work programs, and we noticed that, uh, generally speaking, there are some um, uh, political uh, dimensions or issues which are being dealt with directly in the, in the implementing acts, and which, in our view, could have been more uh, wisely uh, de dealt with via delegated act. For example, if you we we take a look at the um, uh, 2016 amendment of the annual work program, the Commission introduced um, a new action to support for refugee immigration, for refugee integration, sorry, uh, in, the, in the context of the, the great wave of uh, migratory which started in 2015. And whilst this, this um, political, uh, this policy development uh, has uh, arguably a political dimension which would have been uh, um, more uh, ideally taken care of in the delegated acts while imp imp uh, implicating also the called legislators. Why this is important? It's, uh, it's because um, the future uh, Creative Europe regulation Whilst uh, in this future Creative Europe regulation, the co-legislator needs to need to um, wisely decide whether to, to delegate to the Commission delegating or implementing powers uh, in uh, implementing the law. Um, also, because the, the, a balance needs to be struck between um, uh, legal certainty, coherence, democratic debate, and transparency on one side, and also in order to ensure the much-needed flexibility for the program implementation on the other side. I'll now discuss uh, another aspect of the, of the study, which is the synergies between Creative Europe and other EU-funded programs, including structural funds, Horizon 2020, or Erasmus+, Plus, to name a few. Uh, some very important aspects here is that um, the priorities and objectives of Creative Europe are more and more included in other programs through specific calls for proposals. However, there is no kind of official um, strategy about it, and there is no joint implementation mm -hmm. of calls or a one-stop shop a web page to access information for the cultural and creative sectors. Uh, there are some good examples, however. One is uh, the European Year of Cultural Heritage, which is clearly uh, mentioned in other programs, notably Horizon 2020 and also with some other uh, European and na national programs, so for example media, uh, which uh, helps a lot in getting funding for, from Eurimage, for example, or also for national funding schemes. But I would like to move on quickly to the uh, perhaps most important part for you today, which is the conclusions and policy recommendations. First, um, the future program needs to take into account a couple of evolutions here. One is changes in consumption patterns, how younger people actually consume, let's say, culture and cultural content. An important role is also um, the importance of cities and local authorities in how they invest in culture and the creative sectors, and the, uh, in terms of funding, but also in terms of innovative policies. This is very important. There is also an evolution in the sector itself, moving towards collaborative work, um, cross-sectorial work, and innovating itself, uh, towards, especially towards social innovation. Finally, we, we discuss it uh, quite often, but the power of digital platform is growing. It's taking an increasing importance for the sector in terms of remuneration, also in terms of dissemination and access to content. And this needs to be taken into account for the future. Finally, there is the willingness, not only at, from the EU, but also from that country, to uh, engage in cultural external relations as well. <clears throat> so that's why we have uh, prepared some policy recommendations for an ambitious Creative Europe program post-2020. Ambitious in terms of budget, we call for uh, an increase of, of the budget, but also in terms of visibility and outreach of the program. And perhaps most, more importantly, to build scale and enable ex experimentations through large-scale, cross-sectorial, innovative projects. We also call to strengthen Creative Europe's international dimension and therefore to uh, earmark a clear funding line for international cultural relations in the future program. 
We call for better measurement of the program's social and cultural impacts via an observatory. Um, and finally, to strengthen Creative Europe's impact for social innovation through challenges and prize, especially. Just one concluding remark. We would like to say that Europe is a very creative place, lots of creative and cultural talents, and we need to make the most of this. So this is why we cannot say that culture is everywhere, but yet is only representing 0.15% of the EU budget. So we need to act towards um, a more cultural society in the future as well. Thank you.